that love of Torah, that love of Yiddishkeit, that love of another Jew that my father had, this was his life. He saw such light and illumination in the, in the neshama of a Yid. I think the greatest life lesson that he gave over was the value of each individual, no matter who they are, no matter where they come from. He never judged. He loved everyone, no matter what. He just had so much room in his heart for every human being. His greatest pride was building a person. He was a builder of people. Shlema saw in you what you really could become. There probably isn't a day that goes by that I don't say, how would Rav Shlema have handled it? I mean, Freifeld was a doctor of the soul. He learned from everybody. He learned from every situation. He had that ability to make people feel very, very special. I really think his only goal was just to do Hashem's Ratzon. He's just love Hashem's kids. So I remember Rabbi Shlomo Freifel gave a bang on his table and he said to me, Charisma? That's a dirty word. He says, you don't make Jews Jews because it's a charisma. He says, you make Jews Jews because you have a heart and you have a soul. It's a pleasure to speak of people. They had a love for everyone, every Jew. They had a serious nefesh for others. They had no limitations. So it is really my bracha. Since you're speaking about people that are willing to do for others, a person is willing to give up from himself, his, his own covet, his whatever, he, whatever he has. So my bracha is that this institution that is trying to help People love Klal Yisrael, love to one another. And I think Tisha B'Av is a Zman that we have to think about others. We are not a Yochid. We are part of Klal Yisrael. Amishkan mizbebe yachosim Nilekar neyohidon Uleneir tamid ekachli Esebe isha keidon My father Shlita told me a beautiful line about Ronnie Greenwald, and he said, An erlicha askon. Askon means those who understand there's a need for the tzayr, the cloud. There's a tzayr to do things for the cloud. 
to help individuals and help the Klal at large. Baruch Hashem, I was privileged to have opportunities to see and work with Ronnie Greenwald, understanding what it was to see a person that never thought about anything besides the objective, help somebody else. What can you do for somebody else? My father was born in New York. His family was extremely poor. His parents uh, were greeners. They came from Europe with two other children with very, very little. You would never know this in his personality. He was always giving over an enormous amount of positive energy. And we believe that that came from his, uh, his mother, who was an extremely talented, capable, exciting personality who was involved in many, many things in spite of their uh, limit, limited resources. He was, I think, six years old when his mother got sick. He spent some time in an orphanage. You know, some people become victims and some people decide that I'm not going to let anybody go through this if I could stop it. He became a determined person to never see anyone suffer again. It was deeply integrated because his sensitivity and his recognition of the invisible person. He always noticed those people that were not noticed. Just the fact that you were alive and breathing and God created you, that already made you unbelievable and wanted to do whatever he could for if he had the opportunity to do that. He would be looking for people to help. Like just, we would go out for breakfast and he'd be looking around the room, all right, anybody suffering? Let me see what I can do. And he'd just lift them up. This is a personal story that I have never shared with anybody uh, verbally. I met Ronnie Greenwald and I had him as a Rebbe. When I was 15, my father passed away. My mother was quite ill at the time. The problem was that we had no money uh, just, just simply for food. And I was very frightened, you know, I'm just 15 years old and uh, I'm the head of the household. And I get a call out of the blue well, this is going on from Ronnie. You know, your father just passed away. Must be tough times. I have extra cash, $300. Let me give it to you. And you know, he didn't want to make it sound like he was a doctor. He said, you pay it back, don't worry about it. Just take it for now. But I understood that it was really, uh, no, it was not, uh, that wasn't his intention to get paid back. So I, I, I put up a little bit of a, of a debate. I, I said, no, I'm not taking it. And bottom line is, he insisted I took it. And that really is what kept us going. He lived with his eyes open, yeah. Like, everything was an opportunity. There's no question that the word driven is a word that well describes his personality. He was always doing things. He was always involved, and he always cared. Remember, when we were engaged, we went to watch the Macy's Day Parade. He said, I wish, I would love to organize this, or to run Columbia University, to do something. You know, he had all this energy, and he had all these ideas, and all this passion. If something big came by, he would be able to do it. I don't know if he was driven by anything more than, I can, so I will. I asked my father once how he got started with all this politics. He said that his first involvement in the political side of things was as a, a Rebbe. So they had these Russian immigrants and they were applying for political asylum and couldn't receive it. And so he went to Washington. He found somehow a name of someone in the State Department to allow them to get political asylum and to be able to stay. And that's when he had his first kind of, I guess his first experience in Washington. He went from being a Rebbe to an executive in term Missouri. And from there, he started the famous camps, Sternberg and Camp Morgan Avram, camps that functioned for people that couldn't afford camp. When Mishkan the camp came to be, he had to come to Camp Sternberg. When Ohel came to be, he was a player in Ohel. It was seeing a need and doing something. He needed a political connection to get something done. It was him, someone that was not feeling well, needed a good doctor, he'd, he'd connect. Um, he was, you know, someone didn't have money, someone had a problem with a child. I mean, he, it, it ran the gamut. When uh, Dr. Bernard Lander came to him and said, Ronnie, I want to start a college, but I, I don't have a building, I don't know where to start. Ronnie got in touch with Louis Lefkowitz, who got 
put him in contact with other people, and Turo College began in a free building from the state. The summer camps to him were so essential. He loved the kids and he wanted to give them a summary. He wanted them to get away from the regular school system and give them a chance to breathe and be excited. The 50 years that he uh, ran camps for children during the summer, that was the central and most important thing that he believed that he did in his whole life. Ronnie called me up one day and said, you know, Doc, we gotta make a camp for the handicapped in Sternberg. I said, what are you talking about? He didn't even discuss it with me. <laughs> I found out about it just about the same time everyone else did. I said, Ronnie, you may lose all the parents from Sternberg. He said, well, you'll talk to them and you'll get it worked out. And everyone said, no, you can't do this. These kids have diseases, and, and, and what are people going to say? And people aren't going to want to send their kids. And he said, it's going to be good for them, and it's going to be good for our girls. Let them see that these are people, that we care for them, that they're part of Klai Yisrael, and that we love them. In those years, most Orthodox people were giving away the handicapped children. They didn't want them at home. Some of them were being upgeshmad by Goyim. But these girls got involved. Eventually, these girls grew up married and had the children of their own. And because they knew what was going on in Mishkan, that changed the whole view of the Orthodox in terms of what handicaps are all about. So the chachma behind it was very, very great. And he stuck to his guns because this is something, a vision that he had, that these children, they'll be loved and cherished in the community. And guess what? Like many other programs that he started in Camp Sternberg, other camps saw, hey, there's real value here. We should do the same thing. One day, Ronnie calls me up. He says, Joe, we're going to Mexico. I said, Ronnie, I ain't going. I said, what am I doing in Mexico? He says, well, there's a Rabbi Zrihan there, and he has a handicapped child he wants to get into Michigan. I said, Rabbi Greenwald, we are federally funded, we are state funded, and I'm not going to jail for any handicapped child from Mexico. He says, Doc, don't worry about it. We'll work it out. So we went to Mexico. We somehow got the boy into New York and he became a member of Michigan. So as a teenager, I thought he could be elected president. As I became older, I realized that wasn't likely, but I, I saw him do these things that were supposed to be impossible and they were not impossible by any stretch. There's a famous uh, line that he said, the difference between possible and impossible is 10 minutes. Don't just say so quickly that it can't be done. Or, or it's too much. Let's just, let's just sit it out and, and let's think and see. My father said that when he was young, there was one mitzvah that he really always wished he could do. I really wish I could do pidyon shvuyim. Remember, this is before technology, okay? Long distance call was expensive. Plane rides were longer. But it really was something he thought about. He wanted it. And um, I wonder if that's not how so many things came his way. There was an Israeli man who was flying with his brother-in-law near Mozambique, and because of strong winds, he ended up flying over Mozambique itself. The plane was shot down. He was held as a prisoner for a couple of years. My father was called upon to see if he can negotiate a release for him. Congressman Ben Gilman was a very caring, well-connected gentleman and Ronnie called him. It was about four or five in the morning. Gilman's first reaction was, Ronnie, are you drunk? <laughs> What's going on here? Um, he said, no, and he said, okay. So he met him at the airport. It was actually the night of Pesach that they had to arrange this prisoner swap of some kind. And Ronnie told me he was going. I said, Ronnie, it's gonna be a rough Pesach. He says, I spoke to Abmeister, Abmeister said I'd do what I gotta do. If I don't make a Seder, I don't make a Seder. Um, they stopped off in South Africa on the way. They had a small Seder conducted over there, and they got back on the plane and started flying towards the, the area where this uh, release was supposed to be taking place. There had been a similar prisoner swap uh, a few weeks before that, and the person who arranged for it and who conducted it was shot. And uh, my father was there on that same bridge doing the same thing, Seder night. My father went to meet him. They gave him a big hug, he embraced him. And he said to him, do you know what night this is? And my father said, Hayom ze Pesach, Zman Kiruseinu. And thank God they both returned safely.
We were at an OU convention in Eretz Yisrael in Yerushalayim, and one night we got a call from this uh, member of the Knesset, Flato Sharon, who was a very controversial figure. And he said, maybe you can help get Sharansky. And Sharansky was a big hot item then, who wouldn't want to help Sharansky? I was a refusenik, what means I was refused uh, to be given, to, to be granted the visa. Uh, and as many Jewish refuseniks lost my job, was under permanent interrogations uh, by KGB. Uh, in the middle of the struggle, I met my future wife, Avital, then Natalia. And uh, we had a chupa uh, in our apartment, and next day she left for Israel. And we hoped that we will meet in a few months as a result of our struggle. We met 12 years later. I was arrested and accused in high treason for my Zionist security. I came to Israel. Here we organized like headquarter. We decided every Jew in the world has to know what's going on with the brothers and sisters in, uh, in Russia. We start to travel from country to country, from synagogue to synagogue, kehila to kehila, and uh, I succeed to come to Senate and to Congress of the United States. One of these congressmen was uh, Ben Gilman. And when I arrived to his office, uh, there was other man, and he introduced him like Rabbi Greenwald. And the man was uh, nice, warm, uh, and I understand immediately this guy know how to do things. And then I spent time with his family in Monsi, and uh, very warm, and I spent their Shabbat. And then we tried to talk about this swap. I first met Rabbi Ronnie Greenwald when I was an attorney at the Department of State, and the department was approached by Congressman Ben Gilman. Rabbi Greenwald and Gilman were particularly interested in the release of dissidents, but Jews in particular, because they were uh, persecuted at uh, alarming rates. Saransky had been at the top of our list of persons we wanted out of the Soviet Union for a very long period of time. He was an extraordinarily courageous man standing up for human rights. Ronnie was just this wonderful character in the best sense of the word. He was open. He was clearly very smart. He tried. He, he traveled a lot. And uh, he talked to people. And who knows what else he did. And he had through uh, an Israeli member of the Knesset named Flato Sharon, contacted Wolfgang Vogel, a lawyer in East Berlin, which led to prisoner exchanges that ultimately led to the release of uh, Anatoly or Nathan Sharansky. When I came to Congress and Senate, and uh, I met practically with all of them. Uh, Congressman Ben Gilman was one of them. And when I came uh, there in his office was uh, Ronnie Greenwood, and I said, oh, you're the Ronnie Greenwood that I heard from Avital. And that's how we met. I uh, remember he was permanently full of energy, full of initiative, and full of desire to help. I think his energy, optimism, all the time, to be alert to hear the needs of the Jewish people, what's going on. I think it's a very important legacy. So this Pidjon Shvuyam idea played out as he rescued people from all over the world in communist countries and other things, but also how he rescued people from difficult situations, whether they were abusive physically or emotionally. Whatever it was, he was there for them. I grew up in Brooklyn, in the Syrian community. I started hanging out with the wrong people. At some point, my dad tried to get me to go to boarding school because it was really bad. I got into Munsi Academy. Munsi Academy was run by Rabbi Greenwald. 
Rabbi Greenwald always saw me as an individual. He was accepting, he was loving. At the end of my senior year, Rabbi Greenwald told me he wanted me to go to Israel. I always believed in Judaism. I just didn't see my future in it. Getting me to Israel changed my life. I started keeping Shabbos and kosher. I met my husband here, and Rabbi Greenwald gave me a call. There are a few girls who want to come to your wedding. Give me two names. So he flew two of my very close friends into my wedding. He came to my wedding. I was the first Muncie Academy girl to get married. He was filled with light. When my father did these things, he didn't tell anyone. No one knew. He did so many acts of chesed, quiet. I mean, people knew of his chesed, but they knew like a, a drop in the bucket of all the things he did quietly. After he was nifter, somebody compiled emails that girls sent in from camp and from the school and from all walks of life. And the, there was just page after page after page of, of, of another girl who <laughs> felt that her life was changed and her life was saved and how she finally saw somebody who cared about her. And so I think that was a, a big theme in all of the letters. People came to the house constantly. They were people with divorce cases and custody cases, and no one was able to help them. And my husband got through to people. He was able to arrange amicable divorces and custody cases where no one else was able to do it. Uh, the woman who had to run away because she was in a very terrible marriage, she found a place in my parents' house. The young woman with two children who had to get divorced because her husband started using drugs again and could not live that way. When someone needed a place, I guess they knew the address. It really bothered him that people had to be labeled. And I don't want to hear about, you know, somebody else defining you because you, you know, you went to a certain school or you live in a certain community. I think the most, the greatest life lesson that he gave over to me, to us, was the value of each individual, no matter who they are, no matter where they come from, no matter what they look like. He, did, he didn't talk about it, but he lived it. Girls who wouldn't talk to anyone, after a few minutes with him, they just opened up because they felt that he loved them and he wanted the best for them and he wasn't gonna try to, you know, mess them up in any way or report them or, or whatever it was. The principal told my father that he doesn't know what to do with this girl who he has to tell her to close her, her top button every single day. How many times do you have to say something to a kid before they listen? It just doesn't make sense. You say it again and again, they don't listen? So my father said, one second, you say it, you say it again and again? And does it work? He says, no. So what do you do? I say it again. And does it work? No. So how many times do you have to say it till you learn that it doesn't work? And try something else. He never looked at the way a person was. He looked at what the person could be. There's a shama there, there's, there's more than you can see. I, I know so many kids who people had just given up on, totally given up on. And he spent, you know, we'd take them out to breakfast once a week. And a lot of these kids are productive, happy, healthy kids today. It, it's, it's unbelievable. He wasn't afraid to fail, so I fail. And he said many times, I failed in many things. Many things didn't work that I tried. But he, he didn't stop trying, and so he also accomplished many great things. And I think his competencies continued to grow as he succeeded in more and more areas. One thing that I hope when people hear about my father, that I hope we can take for ourselves, is um, when we hear about the love that he had for each person, the belief in them, even if it looks like they're not in such a great place right now, but we don't know anything and we don't have to. We just have to know that they are created by God and they are precious and there's no one else like them. He just had so much room in his heart for every human being. Love one another. Be there for one another. Care about one another. That was his mantra. You have to, everyone has to look out for everyone else. You have to look out for yourself, true. Not to your own detriment, but the other person is just as important and you have to be there for him or her. And don't be judgmental. I can't tell you how many hundreds of people I've come across like, your father is my best friend. It's amazing, it was really special.
I really think his only goal was just to be a good Jew. It was just to do Hashem's Ratzon. It's just love Hashem's kids. I put in the three biggest Talmudim, Rabban Shlita, the Beris Shlita, a summer rifle. I remember, at Sukkis, I got the phone call that he wasn't here, Shloim Zavek. And I cried, and I told my wife, this is the first time that I could say I'm happy that Putin is not here. She said, why? I don't know how we could ever tell him Hashem Refeifeld was Nifta. That was their relationship. He was encouraged by his Rebbe Rav Hutner to be the most that he could be, as he wanted each of us to be. When I was 15 years old, I went to Yeshiva Chaim Berlin. The Rosh Yeshiva of Chaim Berlin was Rav Yitzchak Kutner. The Menahel was Rav Shalom Refeifeld. Someone introduced him to me and he says, I want you to know this is Shmuel Brazil from Boston. And he grabbed my hand in the Shalom Aleichem, which I don't know if that Shalom Aleichem could be duplicated. It was so full of warmth and simcha. It made me feel so hush of, here I am, a little 15-year-old kid <laughs> coming here to this tall Rabbi Freifel. And I think that was the beginning of having such a relationship. He was a towering figure physically and a personality that was bombastic, full of life, and you just met him for the first time and just his handshake kind of won you over. Many people talk about the Rav Shlomo's Shalom Aleichem. It wasn't a nice city, it wasn't something that he read in Dale Carnegie. He used to say it and you walk into a shul, you walk into yeshiva, no one recognizes you. You don't feel like you're an entity. Somebody comes over and gives you Shalom Aleichem, they give you a sense of being, a sense of who you are, that you're, you're something, it's you're important to that person. You saw what the Rabboni Shalom had in mind, what a human being was supposed to be. The total picture and the midos and the learning and the menschlichkeit, the smile. His smile is a smile that went straight to you in the show. I still feel the warmth of his Shalom Aleichem today. One time, he was saying the shear over, and when he finished a Rosh Yeshiva, from a different place walked in. So after being inspired from that this year, you had like 70 guys all of a sudden just stood up and they saw a yid. They went over and said, Shalom Aleichem. He was so overwhelmed with Rosh Yeshiva that he remarked, he says, what is this Kiddush Levana? I think the greatest story, there's a lot of stories, but I think the greatest story is two words. It's called Shar Yashiv. Chaim Berlin was in the neighborhood, and Chaim Berlin was going to Brooklyn, and there were over a dozen Bachram that they asked him to stay in Farakh and not come with them to Brooklyn. I was in Chaim Berlin, I was from the lucky fellas that when they were moving back to Brooklyn, certain guys, they didn't want to take along because they wanted to build the yeshiva with, uh, with good Talmidim. Rav Shloyma wanted me, and the whole life changed. My rabbi called me in one day, I hold you have tremendous potential. I would love if you would come join me in the new yeshiva. And I was just like, wow, my Rebbe's inviting me to go be one of the original Bachrim in his yeshiva. And I felt this was like the opportunity of a lifetime. He took that core of boys, and a couple of Talmudim were close to him from the outside, like me, and he started the yeshiva. The Rebbe Tzinalea Shalom gave that name. The name itself means the remnants should return, everyone should return. Everyone should come to their rightful heritage. There were more boys from yeshiva backgrounds than there were Baal Shuvas. But since my father was open to every kind of Yiddish, across the country, you know, if anyone showed a little bit of interest in Yiddish guy, didn't know much, call Rabbi Freifel. He wanted every young man to find his connection to Torah. Youth were, all of us, were affected by the turmoil of the time, it was the 60s. I had always succeeded well in yeshiva and I was connected to yeshiva, but looking for some peace of mind, looking for something to believe in, and Rebbe understood that need. 
And then as the yeshiva got bigger, the word got out that his ava for every single yid, whether you were from, not from, you wore a hat, you didn't wear a hat, you were a big yarmulke, you were a small yarmulke, you had payas. How long is his payas? He used to call that the quantum theory of Yiddishkeit. It's all about quantities. He says you have to look into the yid, you have to see the neshama. And every yid has a neshama. You have to nurture it, you've got to cultivate it. I was 17, and it was the summer of the draft, and I was strongly considering Vietnam. My brother, who was a Chaim Berliner, suggested I meet Rav Schleimer, and I met this giant of a man, and he said, I have one question for you. Do you want to learn? I said, yeah, right. He says, okay, then you're in. I need a person I could relate to. I need a person that I could speak to. And so I did decide to come to Shayashiv. And of course, Rabbi Freifel was very welcoming. I ended up marrying his daughter. So if it's sure good, <laughs> that's the way Hashem led it. You know, I make the joke that Yaakov Avina worked for seven years for Lovin's daughter. I only worked five years to get to Rabbi's daughter. Shlomo himself loved Igunim, and he loved to sing him. He, in fact, told me to take a certain Igun and find a pussy that we could put to those words, because it's, it's a Heiligen Igun. Dun, 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 chazak v'yam 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 I'll mention what happened when what was the folk singer, the star of the generation, came to the neighborhood. When Bob Dylan came to the neighborhood, I believe he came for a Sheva Brachas. That night, Rebbe spoke to him privately. I, myself, and the entire generation was, you know, enthralled and enamored by Bob Dylan. And of course, we were all interested in what happened and what transpired in that conversation. He said to me, listen to these words, he said, David, you're in better shape than Bob Dylan. I asked him, what are his plans for the future? What are his dreams? What are his aspirations? What does he want to create? What does he want to build? What does he want to accomplish? And he didn't have answers. And you have answers. You know where you want to go. You know what you want to do. You know what you believe in and where you're at. So you're ahead of him. So instead of using that experience to knock him, and which would have not been effective and would have just made me turn around and saying, you know, okay. Instead, he uses it, and I walked out a foot taller saying, you know, I'm ahead of, uh, of Bob Dylan, you know, I'm in better shape. One day I decided I want to go to this yeshiva. I came home and I told my mother, found where I want to go, and I found where I'm going to be happy. I don't think that's for you. She says, why? because it's known as about tshuva, yeshiva. And I don't think it's good for you, you're gonna to have to do a shidduch soon, and it's not gonna be the right thing. And I couldn't move her, I couldn't change her mind. I get this brilliant idea. Maybe the Rosh Hashiva can talk to my mother. Perfect plan, you know, put it on him. And he looks at me and says, your mother's an almona. You want to be Mitzayr and Almona? I said, no, I would just like to be, go to a place where I'm going to have a tachlis and I'm going to be able to learn. And he says to me, you know what? You come here whenever you want to. Whenever you want to, we'll learn together. And that's how my Kesher started with Rav Shleimer Freifeld. I was a regular secular Jew growing up in the Chicago area. I went the usual traditional Hebrew school, got my bar mitzvah, had nothing to do with Judaism, graduated high school. I was getting involved in a lot of left-wing radical organizations because I wanted a sense of meaning and purpose in my life and I wanted to change the world. I was an idealist. Came to Shea Yashiv and I met Rabbi Freifeld and it was love at first sight. It was exactly what I was looking for. I think that's the, the greatest story you could say, that he made such yeshiva that keeps going, that's able to go ahead and take all different types of bachrim, because he felt that he could give them, that no one else could give them. He was way ahead of his time. It didn't make a difference. If you were a yid and you wanted to learn Torah and you wanted to grow and you wanted to have uh, Muna and, and, and Abbas Hashem, so Shlomo was there to, uh, to help you. One day my roommate came home 
and he said, I was just by Chaim Berlin and Rav Hutner Zatzal introduced this new nigan Bulbavi Mishkan Evna. The words were so powerful. A person should build a tabernacle, a base hamikdash in his heart. Yeah, and I said, I think I have a nigan that's going to bring out the words even better. I took my nigan from the words of Urachum. It was a hit. The day that Rav Hutner Zatzal came to the yeshiva. We were making a seam on the Sakhla Megillah. was the first seam of the yeshiva. was the second year. And after all, it was one of his closest Talmidim, Rav Reifel, gave a bracha to the yeshiva. And then we sang Bulbavi. <laughs> I heard they got so overwhelmed with it. He like asked out loud, "There gemacht them niggin. Who made up this niggin?" And he said, "You made this niggin. Do you make other nigunim also?" And I said, "Yes." So he says, "Say a shame. You have to come one day to me, and I want to hear some of your nigunim." I mean, Freifeld was a, a doctor of the soul. To see how he was able to be mechazic people wherever he went, just his existence inspired people. He was a, um, an, like an earthquake of a person. I don't know how to describe it. He was like a volcano. When a bacha used to ask a question, he would make it so alive, he would jump around the base medish, clap his hands, bring over someone, take a look what he answered. You felt so good after hearing him speak about you. He was always looking at you carefully. He was always listening to what you said. He was watching and listening to understand you better. What he said about himself one time, he says, I'm a very good listener. Even when I talk, I'm listening. I remember once I was driving him home from a Levaya, and he said a comment to me I'll never forget. He said, you know, Moshe, I can meet a young man for the first time. And in 30 seconds, I could figure out what he has to hear in order to like reach higher. But you know, sometimes I have to wait years to find that opening so that I could say the words and they'll sink in. It was artistry. I lost my father when I was 12. He treated me like a son. I think he treated all of us like children, like sons. He always looked at what our future could be, what kind of family we could have what potential we had. He gave us such strength because of that, because we knew that that's what his goal was. With these people, he created a beautiful community in Farakaway. Guys were learning guys, Balabatim. To his credit, that Farakaway today is L'Shem El Teferis, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful community with yeshivas and, and rebbes and koilos, and he spilled out into the five towns also. It was a very warm summer day. One of my kids picked up the phone and said, someone is calling, he says he's a good friend of yours. I got on the phone, and it was Reb Shlomo. And he said to me, my she don't love me anymore. I said, Rebbe, of course I love you. So he says, how come, we don't, how come we don't visit? Where are you? So I said, why don't I come? He said, right now. I ran over. When I came into him, he was on the phone like yelling at somebody, and I, I got scared, and I started like the back guy. He said, he went to me, like to sit down. I sat down, and he said, and he was yelling at a guy, and he said, I remember very clearly, he was saying, Shia, if you ever do that again, once, once, I'll give you this last time, if you ever do that to me ever again in your life, I'm never gonna forgive you. And, and I didn't know, how was he letting me sit over there? I did, and, and he even said his name, Shia, and I knew who Shia was, because there was one Shia in those years in the yeshiva, and he was yelling at him. And then Reb Shlomo started laughing. He said, you know, I hate schmaltz herring. I hate schmaltz herring. I only want pickled herring at my table. <laughs> and then he was laughing. Uh, and I sat down and he said to me, Maisha, I thought you said you love me. I said, Rebbe, I, I love you. I love you. He said, if you'd love me, you take off that hat and jacket. It's making me so uncomfortable. It's so hot. Could you just please take that off and make yourself comfortable? And then out of nowhere, Mamish, out of the blue, he said to me, I have an idea for you. He said, I think that you should go to Woodmere and to, 
to be a Rav in Woodmere, to have a shul in Woodmere. Now, this was the furthest thing in the world from my mind. And I asked him, but Rabbi, what am I supposed to do? I don't have any money. I'm supposed to open a shtibble. So he said to me, I'm not your financial advisor. I'm your friend. And I think that you would be very good at that. I think that the Jews could use that. Part of Rebbe's magic was that ability to, to understand where a person is, where their soul is. You could feel that he's looking at your potential of what you could become. He gave everyone a chance. One fellow came, he didn't know how to read or write English. And my father-in-law was, you know, really felt for him. He sat and learned with him the ABCs and taught him how to read and was teaching him English. And it says, for me, teaching him English is Yiddishkeit. Besides being a warm person, he also was very wise. He has very deep understanding of people. A dear, dear, dear friend of mine. He was in the yeshiva when I was in the yeshiva. And uh, he had juvenile onset diabetes. And at this point in his life, in his 40s, he was very sick. So he was a big baseball fan. He loved baseball. Uh, so we decided we're going to get a nice league baseball. And we'll get everybody to sign it. We want to cheer him up. And who are we going to go to first? Go to Rabbi Freifeld. <laughs> we go up to his big chair. So he smiled a big smile, takes the ball, takes his pen, and writes, Shlomo Babes Freifeld. <laughs> We're like, we like looked at the ball. That's too good. It lifted his spirits. Like you know, he had such a broad mind to think. Like I'm a rashiva, this and that. Yeah. In the summer of '69, the yeshiva had a bungalow colony. We would take the bachurim up, and some of the Yungalite families, they blossomed in those one and a half months more than they could do half a year in the yeshiva. I don't want to say that we're chilled, but it was relaxed and it was uh, everyone's heart and heads were open to hear. Woodstock was just really down the road. You could walk it. And so you can't imagine how many people came. You know, it was the hippies at that time that were very prevalent. And uh, it was, there was a traffic jam all the way up to the side of, 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 the, of the bungalow colony. And when Shlomo came out and saw what was happening, he started walking down the road, stopping at every car. Is anyone Jewish? Would you want a place for Shabbos? You come join us. We'll give you some good food and chocolate if you know what that is. And he would just go down and down to each car to try to get someone to come, to come in for Shabbos. Like, he wasn't intimidated at all. I remember another story was that I was in the bungalow colony when I was in Kolel. Rabbi Yeager, who was my Rebbe then, he came over to my wife and he said, you know, I was uh, talking to my father-in-law, Rabbi Freifold, and I was, discussing different things that were happening in Shira, and I told him something that your husband Moshe said over. And Rabbi Freifel's eyes lit up, and he says, Rabbi Naftali, you go right now, and you find Rabbi Moshe's wife, and you tell her that she's married to a Tamachachim. He knew I needed that kind of chizik so that I could continue going, because I was so far behind. I'm 23, 24 years old, and I can't, I can barely read a Mishnah Brewery, you know? So you'll get there, you'll get there, you'll get there. We used to travel up to come to Muncie, and I said to my wife, you know, we're going up the FDR, let's stop off to visit Rip Shlema. We drive up, we get to the hospital, and we get to his room, and he was, he was in this little room, and he was a giant of a person in this little room, and I walk into the room, and my wife stands by the door, and he gives a half look at her. You're on your way up to Muncie? He goes, what? And before my wife can answer, I say, yeah, we were just headed there and we thought it would be nice to come see the Rosh Hashiva. So who are we having company for Shabbos? He's looking at her. Now I answer, well, my in-laws are coming. And all of a sudden he gives up, Isaac, enough. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to Edie. So you know what? Edie, you come to the bed. Let Isaac go to the door. Because him I talk to all the time. You I never get to talk to. And he was so sick at that time. And he was in such pain. And again, and I looked at him. Just, he just knows how to make every single person feel like a million dollars. 
in his later years when he was sick. Someone always had to be with him when he was in the hospital. It was a very difficult job because he was getting a CAT scan and they thought it went into the liver and of course he was nervous about the test. He had the test. Finally brought him upstairs to the room. It was, we went down around one o'clock. It was already four o'clock. And you know, I got my father into bed and he's finally relaxing. And I see four or five young ladies. I heard Rabbi Freifel was there, so they came to visit Rabbi Freifel. So after the ordeal that he went through that day, I didn't want them to come in. So um, I said, I go like this, please, you know, like. And Rabbi Freifel says to me, Avram. Where's Dutton? He used to speak to me in Yiddish. He likes speaking to me in Yiddish. Who's there? I said, a few girls want to come see the Rebbe. You know, they could come back. No, 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 send them in. In that moment, he was so weak and so wiped out. And he, he welcomed the girls as if he was well. And he spoke for an hour and a half what the role of a Jewish woman is. Like, this was his life. One day, we were going to a bar mitzvah. I told my wife, Edie, I said, Edie, you know what? We're passing by Far Rockaway. I'd like to stop off to wish Shabbos to Rav And he wasn't well at that time anymore. And she said, sure, fine. So my son says, we're going to Rav Freifeld? So I said, yeah, great. Nobody has a Rebbe card of Rav Shlaima Freifeld. My son, Binyamin, or known as Yumi, used to collect Rebbe cards. He was nine years old, and that was the big thing in yeshiva, collecting Rebbe cards. Can I bring my camera, and I'll take a picture? So I said, sure. So we come there, and Shalom is sitting at the table, and we're talking, and my son, ta, ask him, ask him. I find him, Shalom says, Yumi, you want to ask me something? Said, can I take a picture of the Rosh Hashiva? And he looks at him and says, You want to take a picture of me? That's exactly what he said. And the picture a nine year old gets, shakes his hand and says, On one condition, you be in the picture with me. And I took a picture of him hugging my son. And that picture was next to his bed for many, many, many years. A nine-year-old kid felt like a million bucks. But that's not the end of the story. Because two years later, it was Kalamite, Sukkis. And my son was going for a trip to Great Adventure with his class. And I come home from shul, and my son is home. I said, Yumi, you were supposed to go with your class. What happened? And he said, Tati, today's the Levaya of Reb Shlomo Freifeld. How can I go to Great Adventure? I belong to go to that Levaya with you. I have in my office, I have a portrait of Reb Shlomo. Really, a day goes by when something comes up and I don't look at that picture. And um, I say to myself, how would the Rebbe have handled this? What would the Rebbe have done? I really feel I live with Reb Shlomo every day. One year, Moshe Yom Kippur started singing. And he saw in those words, his yeshiva, he saw in the hearts and the minds of the Bachem, you have to go into your own kipper. You want to be dubbing to Hashem, you want to be close to Hashem, you want to steig in learning. You're going to see how good it's going to be because he had such a great yontif, a Yom Kippur. And he would sing it over and over and tears, you could see the tears rolling down his cheeks. The tears of tefillah, the tears of simcha, of hope and tikva that Boys, we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it, we're gonna become big Jews this year.
It gives me a great pleasure to say a few words for a project, Inspire. We're speaking about inspiration. Inspiration for what? Obviously, Tisha B'Av is a time of introspection, thinking, feeling. Feeling for what? Obviously, the loss of the Beis Amigdash. Ba'isheni was destroyed because of Sinas Chinam. Farshan tell us that the schus of the Ba'isheni was because of Knesses Yisrael, the Knesi of Yisrael, Klai Yisrael being one. And as soon as there was any harissa, there was any destruction, any tear in the fabric of Amit Klai Yisrael, Klai Yisrael, it fell apart. We speak about rebuilding the Beis HaMikdash. It's thinking in terms of what can we indeed do to have Ahav HaSchinam? What can we do to change our, our approach, our feeling towards others? In a world as fragmented as it is today, we obviously understand the time has come, it's way past the time, to think in terms of Ichud. Well known, the Goyen tells us that the last hara of the Eitzah hara of the Sitra Achara is Koyach HaMachloikis, division, divisiveness, a breakdown in society. We have this day, once a year, to think very, very strongly about how we must be ma'achid, pull the society together, pull Kla Yisrael together, to rebuild what's called Knesset Yisrael, that Knesset of Kla Yisrael. It's very important to have a production such as this that displays, it brings out, reveals the lives of individuals that really understood the importance of what every yachid can do for Klal Yisrael. It's only a matter of giving it thought, positive thought. That's the word inspiration, to inspire one to understand that it's not me, it's beyond. We just heard from the Rosh Hashiva Shlita, and we watched a film about two inspiring individuals who would stop at nothing to help another Jew. And we wanted to tell ourselves, what can we do to get involved today? What better way to unite Klal Yisrael, like the Rashiva spoke about? And what better way to impact Klal Yisrael than to be able to share our Torah with people who might not be exposed to it otherwise? Here's an opportunity on Tisha B'av to sign up to learn with a one-on-one Harusa, or right below on your screen, you can click on our Click and Share program, which allows you to share an inspiring Tisha B'Av film, a film about Ben Adam L'chaveru with a fellow Jew who might not otherwise know much about Tisha B'Av. And while you're considering signing up for a one-on-one Harusa, let me show you a film of people whose lives were changed by people just like you. Sign up today and make that difference. That will internalize the message that we just saw about helping Klal Yisrael and uniting Klal Yisrael. And with that, we'll be Zoha that this be our last Tisha B'Av, because by next Tisha B'Av, we'll be back in Yerushalayim, Erech Kodesh, v'meheru v'yamenu, Amen. My name is Ali Janowski. My name is Desi Rotenberg. I'm Nevin Burns in Arizona. I've been part of Project Inspire for almost a year now. I'm from Brazil. And I have been a part of the one-on-one learning program for over a year now. I just didn't have a Jewish education. My parents are from the former Soviet Union where it was illegal to learn. Uh, I grew up in a family where unfortunately Judaism and the culture was not passed down. So I didn't know anything coming into this program. We talk about everything from life to liberty to the pursuit of happiness. We started learning once a week. She has made such a huge impact in my life and she just really met me where I was in a totally non-judgmental way. So whatever comes up with relation to Judaism and Torah and Talmud and Mishnah and Kabbalah and anything, we just kind of talk about it and put it out there. Project Inspire has enriched my life by enabling me to set aside 30 minutes to an hour each week and dedicate time to learning about different schools of thought. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't know how to read Hebrew. It's really beautiful to see how Judaism shapes my everyday life, where I would have never even realized that before. So I highly recommend getting matched up with a one-on-one partner if you are looking for a personalized way to stay connected with Judaism in your busy life. I'm very much looking forward to growing in my Judaism and my faith and having a stronger impact on the world around me because of it. Thank you, Project Inspire, and I can't thank you enough, so thanks.
Snap, she, I'm a 